thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind, episode 102. I can over-fertilize a baby rose and kill it. You know, I can kill a seedling by giving it the wrong fertilization. But when my rose is strong and the roots are going down, I can clip its branches off. The roots will go deeper and it's going to grow fuller and stronger. But if I clipped it when it was too young, I'd kill it. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you are ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Anelody Milne. Anelity is the mother of six and counting, the grandmother of eight and counting, and a devoted wife to the perfect partner. She holds a B.A. in statesmanship at the George Wythe University, a cutting-edge liberal arts college where she is a current master's student in the education department. She is currently working on her master's thesis called The Mentoring Approach. She loves the organic process of teaching and learning without compulsion and force where students are free to discover their own genius and to contribute to the world in their unique way. She is an advocate of teachers as mentors and has given the opportunity to train fellow teachers this revolutionary approach at the two companies she works for, for Lemmy Leadership Education Mentoring Institute and Life Changing Services, where she holds the position of Mentoring Training Director. Welcome, Anelity. So, Thank you. I'm really excited to talk to her because I actually went to the Lemmy training this summer and I just felt very inspired by that teaching process. And so I'm excited that she's decided to join us. Do you want to just briefly tell our audience a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Yeah, it could be a long story, could be a short story. But as far as education goes, I don't think that from the very beginning of my grown up years, I felt that I was necessarily a teacher. And I definitely didn't feel super passionate about education per se. I came out of the public school system, sort of in a place where I didn't feel I was very smart, not very accomplished. The whole requirements for graduation and going on to college experience for me was cloudy. I didn't understand the purpose of it. And I've come to realize that I just can't do anything without feeling purpose, without feeling like it's heading me somewhere that God wants me to go and I, or that I feel driven to go. And when I was in my high school experiences and my college experiences, I would say I felt like the experiences I was having in education were meaningless. Textbooks that were very disconnected, I had to memorize facts. It was difficult for me to want to memorize those facts for any, you know. Just because. To, to use, <laughs> yeah, to use the um, energy, to, to consume the energy to memorize those facts. It just didn't seem useful. But there were, I'm a, I'm a very practical person. I like, a, if you were to say, are you the kind of person who applies or you the kind of theoretical person I would say definitely I'm the more of the application person so I you know I taught myself how to sew when I was 10 years old I saw that sewing machine and I really wanted to see what it could do for me and you know my poor mother had to repair her machine so many times I don't know how many times it broke needles and threw off the timing but I was bound and determined to teach myself how to sew and she wasn't she didn't have the time to do it and nobody else around me was doing it for me so I ruined a lot of fabric and <laughs> you know I would actually go babysitting for money so that I could go buy fabric so that I could make something that I thought was cool and ruin it and then <laughs> throw it in the garbage and then, but you know by the time I was 13 years old I was making quilts and drapes and uh, baby clothes and all kinds of things for my friends and so I felt driven with that kind of stuff that I knew I could apply everyone said go to college and so I thought oh we have to go to college so what do I do in college well I can only do what I know to do right so I chose two things I was really highly involved with theater in in high school and I was really highly involved with my sewing so I, I had to choose between musical theater and music and I did textiles uh, clothing and textiles 
So nobody, and, and there really wasn't an, a, a mentor or anybody in my life who, who came to me and said, wow, you are really genius at this. You just need to pursue this. No, nobody, there was no one who ever said that to me. And That's I think to myself, <laughs> if I would have had someone who said, wow, you're really good at this. You should pursue this. I may have been more serious about perhaps sticking in college in doing clothing and textiles. I will tell you, I went to college, I went to Brigham Young University when I was between my junior and senior year of high school during the summer. And I took a flat pattern design class there and a, um, a costume design class, which those two classes have served me for the rest of my life. I have used them. I've used what I learned in those two classes. I can't even, uh, you know, everything that I do, I think in those ways. When I think of solving a problem, I think of how do I create the fat, flat pattern for that? It's very, very interesting the way that I think. So, uh, you know, that those two classes that I took during the time that I really wasn't in college, you know, it was between junior high. I mean, it was between my junior year and my senior year have proved to be, you know, two of the best classes I ever had. But then when I had to decide, oh, I'm going to do a major, I just, I, I never, I, I, I couldn't figure it out. Uh, I ended up going to a year of college and then meeting a man and getting married. And I guess people would say I graduated with my MRS. <laughs> and um, then, but I was always interested in learning. My parents were very well educated. My mother did go to college. She ended up graduating when she was 50 with her degree in uh, family sciences. And my father was an engineer who had a lot of education. And my parents were readers. They read a lot. And so I, education was really a, an important part of my life. But I, I didn't know how to pursue it in a meaningful way. And I was really fortunate that I married a man who was very well read, really motivated to learn. He was a you know, a reader from the very beginning. And, and he just saw a lot, of, a lot of potential in me. He could see that I had passion and I had drive and, and I was smart. But no one really ever said that to me in my growing up years. I always tell people, you spend your most formative years in the most toxic situation that you can, and then you spend your rest of your life overcoming it. Yeah, trying to get over it and become, right? <laughs> throw off those so, feelings. So. so anyway, he he started kind of getting me to go to the library. He started going to the library, getting books for me, and he'll, he would, you know, come home from the library and unassumingly put books on my nightstand and I started reading because he gently proposed it to me in a very organic way and he chose things he knew I would be interested in well I didn't know that I was getting a love of learning at that point in my life and then I was really fortunate to meet some beautiful people who challenged my belief in Christ you know I have considered myself a Christian my whole life. I, I'm a churchgoer. I was raised as a churchgoer. My parents have very strong beliefs about God. And my father comes from a situation where he was, he left his home at a young age. He was put into a university setting when he was 17 years old and they converted him to a secular humanism. And when he met my mother, my mother kind of converted him back to Christianity <laughs> and he had a, he had a super profound experience with that. And so he had a great, great love for the Lord. And so did my mother. So I grew up in that way, but I didn't actually, I don't know, own it for myself. And so I had some friends who helped me become, they challenged me. That's really what they did. They just said, you know, the scriptures say this, is this working in your life? And it wasn't. And so I, I had the fortunate opportunity to have a very profound spiritual conversion when I was 27 years old. So I would say that was part of my education. I would call that my core phase. And at that time, I started ravenously digging through my core book, my scriptures, and read them through and through. And you know, just they became just 
part of my life in a, in a great big way. When we're talking about core phase and love of learning, those are kind of terms that Thomas I, Jefferson I can, education uses, correct? Yeah, and I would consider that everybody's education, right? They, they're terms that Thomas Jefferson uses, Thomas Jefferson education uses, but I, I think that if you look at some of the other educational philosophers, such as uh, John Holt, Erickson, Piaget, even Plato, I think that you would see that they all would consider anything that brings you to a foundational principles would be your first level of education. And and that's core. I mean, that's why I mean, that that's makes sense. What, core phase. Yeah, makes. that's what, yeah, that's what Thomas Jefferson education calls it is core phase. You know, uh, Plato called it the grammar phase. The, and, and the grammar phase, they would they describe the grammar phase in, in a little bit different way than we understand it today. And it would be something more that's core learning. So, yeah, I would say that was part of my education. And I didn't get that till I was 27 years old. And I really didn't I didn't really start picking up loving to learn and, and having passion about learning until shortly after that. So I would say my true, real, meaningful education came late in life. Yeah. Well, and I think it is interesting. I mean, you have to kind of go through those phases to get to kind of the other side, uh, kind of right. with your statesman, right? Exactly. Right. And, you know, what happened to me was I, uh, because I was getting that kind of education in, you know, those later years in my, in my life, when the opportunity rose for me to get really serious about getting an education, I was ready. Yeah. And I met what I would call one of my first mentors, my first real education mentors was Tiffany Earl. Yeah, um, she's one of the founders with you of the Lemmy uh, training, yeah. which we'll talk about, right. hopefully, later. leadership <laughs> education mentoring is yes. yes. <laughs> and you know, when she first started giving me material to read that was outside of anything I'd be interested in, see, so this is kind of how I see things. You have to find your core. What, what are the foundational principles you're going to stand on? And then you have to discover the things that you're passionate and excited about. But beyond that, you need to go to, I'm not so excited about learning about this, but I need to learn about it. And for me, those things would be government history. I don't love those things. Science, not necessarily love them. Math. I don't love but all four of those things have been have become a very strong part of what I do. Tiffany taught me how to think in in logical and lines of logic. And when I finally started connecting, oh, this is just math. The math is the language that I'm using. You know, numbers are the language that I'm using over here to describe logic. But I can use words too to describe logic. So when I started understanding that the language didn't really matter, but the learning how to, to use lines of logic and how to reason through things that I was just learning that math is a good, good language to use to describe that process. Right. Yeah. And so that's when I started really say, Oh, I get it. Oh my gosh, this is, education this is th this is what i've been looking for when my mentor began to connect things together for me they became more meaningful and that's when i could really embrace doing the hard things things that i didn't really want to do like i don't love history it's hard for me to memorize all those dates it's hard for me to remember oh who was that guy who did that when and that when did this happen and how did you know it's hard for me to really want to put the mental energy into connecting that but because I had a reason to now, because I could say, oh, this is going to be something that I need to know for a purpose. Let me give you an example. So um, my husband is a World War II kind of amateur pro. <laughs> he's been studying World War II since he was young. And he's even written a book on it. And so it's he's he's read no less than 200 books, no less than that on that era. Um, you know, he's all the details of the submarines and the airplanes and all the technology. He's really into the, the atom bomb and all that kind of those super details about that era, because that's where we so much of that came from. And for a long time, I was like, oh, how can you, ugh, you know, ugh, right. <laughs> but 
about three years ago, I started, I had to teach this class. We call it the Sword of Freedom. I guess it was more like five years ago. Uh, sorry, no, it's, it's a Sword of Freedom, which is the, it's the Civil War era time. And then along with that is the second semester we teach a hero project, which is the kind of the World War II era type. And so when I have to teach something, I, it's a lot of pressure for me. And I know that I haven't always I had all the knowledge I needed to. So when I do it, I put all my energy into understanding that whole project. So I read a lot, a lot of World War II history. Like I said, wasn't super interested in it, but I am interested in teaching I like that process. So it gave me a purpose. But I had this huge connection that I never had before. And that is, um, as I was reading about Hitler and his regime, in the, the book is called um, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And when I was reading about him, I started having these connections with the United States. And all of a sudden, my personal freedom was going to be in jeopardy because of these connections that I was having. First of all, um, the German people, they they did not know how to think anymore. It, it, it was taken away from them because of the education system that they had instituted 100 years, 150 years before. And the reason why Hitler was able to take over was through his powerful rhetoric that he used through speaking and writing. The first thing he did was he took over the printing presses. Well, he the first thing he did was he bought a printing press and they started printing paper, you know, printing newspapers and started getting their influence that way. And then he started getting himself in front of people speaking. And he was so convincing and he would appeal to their vanities. He and, and the German people were like, yes, yes go Hitler, this is right, this is the right thing to do, we need to bring our glory back to our nationality, and, and we need to be, re you know, he was angry about World War One and how the Ver uh, the Treaty of Versailles went, and all that kind of stuff, and so he said, you know, the German people have been slighted, they no longer have their glory of all the things that they could have, and you know, they, that's used, all like, vanity. Yeah, fear and their their anger, too. Let, yeah. basically yeah right and, he, yeah, he, yeah. and then he would say things like we're going to get rid of all the dregs of society we're going to get we're going to get rid of you know these slums that we have and no more prostitution and we're going to clean up our streets and we're going to be proud germans it's all vanity yeah. it's all vanity he that's how he got into power that's that's that is exactly how he got into power it was mostly because the german people allowed him to do it yeah so is that how you kind of came to your philosophy with lemmy is just studying our institution like where our learning institutions came from the root of that and where that led yes okay. definitely sh for sure because we actually a uh, hundred years ago adopted the prussian system which is the german system yeah we, we, we are headed down that road yeah, which, um, I mean, like, um, we see it all around us, too, that that we are fed, you know, spoon-fed what they want us to know type of thing, and mm -hmm. the thinking and outside the box. And it's an appeal to our vanities. Yeah. Because they say to us, from the time, I don't even know how young they do it anymore, cause be, but I knew when I was 12 years old, they were already asking me when I was 12 what I wanted to be when I grew up, what kind of career I wanted to have. And I got to tell you, I wanted to be a mother, and nobody said that was okay. Yeah. Nobody validated that. And I'd no, 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 not just a mother, not just a mother. You need to be something else. You need to have something else in your life. Well, I tell people today, my mission is to be a mother. Everything I do is for my children to grow them, yeah. to influence them. I am a mother first and foremost. Okay. So I know a lot about education these days. I know a lot about history. I know a lot about math and science these days. I have a very well-rounded liberal arts education. I have a lot of knowledge in this head and I've built a lot of character in this body. Everything I've done is because I want to be a better mother for my children. Wow. Before we go on, let us take a minute and hear about our sponsors. Changing a paradigm takes some study, but like me, you are probably super busy. 
That's why we've teamed up with Audible. Go to our website, theluminousmind.net. Get a free month of Audible with two audiobooks, thousands of titles in exchange for only books that you absolutely love. You too can be learning on the go to keep that fire burning. Back to the Luminous Mind with Anality Milne with the Leadership Education Mentoring Institute. Wow. So with your educational philosophy, I and mean, we kind of talked about how before you felt that frustration, and then was it finding the Thomas Jefferson education, you know, studying history? I mean, how did um, you come to that? Yes, your for sure. Life? I, I, so I didn't have a college degree, and people all my life has said to me, you know, I, I would say, I want to do this. And they and, and I'm the messages of the world that I got. And I can't say that everyone is gets the same message. But be, because I am who I am, and I'm in the environment that I live in, I just felt like all the messages that I always got was you can't do that. No, 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 you can't do that. So I, I met these really great people who were homeschooling. And I said, wow, that's dumb. <laughs> that's <laughs> really dumb. That's yeah, that's really dumb. <laughs> and um, they said to me, "Well, you know, uh, it's a calling, so y- it might be dumb for some people. But if you, you know, if it's calling, God is calling you to. You ought to find out at least. So you should pray about it." And that was the turning point for me. I got on my knees and asked God, "What is it that you would like me to do with my children?" For the, for the it was it was a novel, novel idea. My my oldest daughter was. I think she was three, four, and my youngest daughter was just turning, my second daughter was just turning 18 months or something like that. And somebody told me to get on my knees and pray about what I should do with my children. It was, it was so novel. (laughs) Don't you just do what everybody else does? Yeah, you just follow the crowd. Yeah. (laughs) Right. That's what you do, right? That's, you know, if the lemmings are all falling off the cliff, you go with them. But I, so I, I prayed about it and it's so weird because I just, uh, I can't say that I had this, oh, that's what you have to do. You, If you don't do that, you're in trouble, you know, whatever. I didn't feel that at all. I just felt this, you know, you should try that. That That's something you should look into. And yeah, just try it and out. So I, no, no, yeah. No, no fear. And so I started, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I don't feel like it was a do it or die kind of feeling. But I think I, I love the way God works with me. I, he, I don't know how he works with everybody else. But with me, it's always, hey, check that out. See what you think. <laughs> and it, then it gives me permission to just say, OK, I'll check it out. And then I get to own it. I get to own my own knowledge of it. So that's what I started doing with homeschooling. I started I did. I ended up homeschooling my children. And I think it's a great choice for many people. It's not the only choice that you have. And for me, it was great because I did have a good a core foundation underneath me. And I think any mother who chooses to homeschool needs to have that. And I was into a very good space of love of learning at the point that I kind of was choosing that. And I think that's another thing that, that mothers need to have. You need to so, be mentoring it for their children. Is that what, where well, you're going with that? I think they need, to, they need to be uh, healthy, emotionally and spiritually healthy enough to do it. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> so, and I happen to be in that space. So I was really fortunate. Um, not everybody is, is is fortunate because they've got more things to overcome than I did. But uh, so I started studying and I started kind of just putting my hand at it, trying it here and there and making lots of mistakes all over the place. And then, but I was a great level learner. So it was easy for me to go to the butcher shop and get you know, some heart and lungs and dis- and get a book and, you know, dis- discover it with my children. And I, it was easy for me to go to the chem shop and, and build volcanoes. And it was easy for me to do all those really fun things. Super easy for me. I, like I said, I'm a, I'm a hands-on applied person. So that stuff was just fun. But then my, as my, sorry, that was the uh, advice I was given was have fun with your children and read with them. So I did. But then my daughter got old enough that I started feeling like, wow, there's some stuff she really needs to have. And she's feeling a little 
isolated and she needs to have some social experiences and so we yeah and that is a don't you feel like that so that yearning for that social thing that is a natural it's not that your children are are saying anything more than just they're growing in their development right i mean yes, that's exactly it, it's not like they don't all of a sudden don't like being around you or anything they're just yes. wanting to look outside their world right right and actually as i've studied that more i've realized that's actually a biological and i think a spiritual thing yeah. Biologic, biologically, their brain is changing. Their body is changing. They have done enough studies on the brain and social development that they understand that children actually really do need some kind of mirror that they can look at other children around their age so that they can kind of measure where they're at. And that's kind of how they get socially appropriate with other people. And they also know that children really see themselves as an extension of their parents until they start going through puberty. And then that's when they start making, creating their own identity. Yeah, they want to feel like they have have a place in the world type of thing. Right. Is that okay? Right. So uh, we tried out public school, a little bit of that, and, and, and came to realize very quickly, I started to understand culture, the word culture and what that meant through our experiences that culture is... It's the environment that we create around us. And in fact, Alexis de Tocqueville said that the American culture was so unique, something he'd never experienced before, that the people in America actually see themselves as sovereign. And uh, so they speak to each other respectfully to one another as if each other are sovereign, are kings, you know. And that was not a culture that the France or England was experiencing at all. And it really began to shape the American people. So culture shapes people. Yeah, it does. And that's when I started thinking, oh, how do I give my children the culture I want them to experience and still be able to fulfill their needs as they grow older? It was a very difficult transitional time for us. It took us about three years to kind of figure that out. But fortunately, again, I had a a mentor come into my life and said, hey, this has been working for us over here. How about you start a little school? And that's when I started a little school in Bountiful, Utah. And uh, with a couple of other families, we started doing uh, thematic unit studies together. I I did start studying John Gatto. John Gatto was a very huge influence on my thinking. He first was probably, uh, he was probably my first real education mentor. He was the one who introduced me to the idea that learning needed to be whole learning. The other mentor that I would say would be huge in my life was Shinichi Suzuki. And uh, I started, I'm a cellist and I started doing the, the Suzuki training. So those two people I would say were my most influential mentors and and what I was learning from them I was bleeding out into my homeschooling well and by Um, whole learning do you want to explain to our audience what you mean is that where you don't separate the subjects where you just kind of embrace it all together or right John Gatto says and I embrace him this this fully he says I teach the disconnection of all things that's my job as a public school teacher my job is to disconnect as much as I possibly can so that no child coming out of my classroom will ever be able to think. Because he says the only way we truly can think is through connection, connecting everything together. And that's when I started to discover about what they call thematic units. Thematic units was kind of revolutionary during the time that I was just starting. My children were starting to get older in homeschooling, and they were doing a lot of thematic unit learning throughout uh, there were these little pockets of charter schools and, and and little programs within public schools that were doing these thematic unit learning things and um, they were doing a lot of studying on it and in fact recently I, I just for my master's degree I read a study that was fascinating uh, back in 19 the, the late 1990s the there was a man who was doing a master's thesis and he wanted to study this thematic unit movement. And so what they did was they set up these two control groups and one was thematic unit learning only and the other was just the subject learning. And they observed them over two weeks. You know, it's just a little study. It's not like they had a lot of money or funding to do this study. 
So they observed them over two weeks and they're learning over two weeks. They were supposedly learning similar subjects, similar things in the two, two classes. And at the end of the two weeks, they gave them a test. And the kids who were doing the more what, we, what I call disconnected learning, the subject learning, actually scored in the 90 percentile of the test. And the kids who were doing the thematic unit learning scored in the 30th percentile of the test. Oh, and so anyone can conclude from that study that you know, thematic unit learning doesn't work, actually, that the subject learning is much better. It, it gives results a lot quicker and it's a lot faster and it's a lot better. Right. Mm -hmm. So there was a guy who was involved with the study and he thought, that's interesting. I don't know if I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently he got some funding to extend the study took the same two groups and followed them over two years. And it, it cost a lot of money to actually create an environment where they would do that thematic teaching for two years with the same group of kids. And then they, they followed the other group of kids just doing the subject learning like they did, you know, in regular. Well, at the end of the two years, they administered the exact same test that they administered at the beginning. And the children who were doing the thematic learning scored in the 90th percentile and this children who had done the subject learning scored in the 30th percentile wow so it's just being able to retain that information longer when we do like a whole whole study all together right, right? like a right, connected because, study because exactly because subject learning actually is very good for people who are quick memorizers but memorizing like that is actually only a goes into short-term memory and there's no meaning connected to it. When we connect the subjects back together, don't you think, too, that allowing us to do that gives us application for our learning and then it right. sticks with us longer? It, would you... Because it goes into long-term learning. They've actually studied the hippocampus, which the hippocampus is where memory is processed, right? And they've actually studied the hippocampus now of the students who do thematic learning and their hippocampus is larger and fires longer than those who do the subject learning. It's very fascinating. And I think over the next few years, I think this is revolutionary. It came out in the 19, late 1980s. It was kind of a fad and it kind of died out because those studies said, oh, it's, it's not effective, right? But I think now that they're going to be doing the brain studies, brain, the brain is, it's the new horizon. I think that once they start seeing what's going on, that they will be able to validate the, the thematic unit learning or the whole, we call it the whole language approach. Some people call it that. Or the, or the connected learning approach, I think it's going to become a much more popular way to teach your children. However, I will say it doesn't help them take a test at the end of the year. And that's what parents are sometimes afraid of. Yeah. And uh, well, and, and our society in general is really based on like, I mean, you see the bumper stickers on the back of the car, you know, my child is an honor student at whatever school or my child is, um, we are really into kind of a prideful attitude when it comes to education. As I said, it's appeal to our vanity. Yeah. It's exactly what the Prussians, it, it is the Prussian inheritance. Wow. <laughs> And I can tell you exactly where that's headed because history shows us where it goes. But I don't believe that there is. I, I, so we aren't exactly German because there is a part of us that is our freedom lovers. And we have a movement in the United States of people who are saying, wait, wait, stop. Something is up with this. Yeah. And we're seeing it all around us, which is very people like us are excited to see that. Yeah, <laughs> so. right. In Germany, that would not have been allowed. Because they came out of the monarch system, their culture was different than ours. While we adopted their education system, our culture was different. And our culture, I believe, is going to save us. Oh, that would be and nice. And <laughs> I believe that our culture is a freedom-loving culture. I believe that's what we were handed down. And I think it's harder. And this is why I think culture is so important and why I think putting your, your children into a situation where the culture is toxic and difficult and pop culture and, and friend-centered and all that kind of stuff, it's going to be so hard to root that out of your children. Because I think culture is so ingrained that it's generational. 
Yeah. You know, that's why the Hat- Hatfields and McCoys are in the mountains still shooting each other. Yeah. And you can see it in the fact that, I mean, how many of us have heard of families say, well, my student or my son or daughter wants me to homeschool them. They don't like the culture, but I really feel like they need to stay. You know, we are parents. It's almost us that are pushing our children back into the school system that they're not happy with in the first place, just because of that traditional, you know, like you were saying, kind of that idea of, of having to stay in that popular, you know, we want them to go to the football games and be the cheerleader and all of that stuff because that's what we grew up with. Would you agree with right. that or what's your... We want them to go to prom. Yeah. You know, that was, you know, I, I have to tell you, when I started, when I, one of the things that, that I heard when I started homeschooling was, your kids are never going to get to go to prom. Oh my gosh, I hope they don't go to prom. <laughs> Oh, I mean, funny. you know, there's there's some of the things in, that I know that that I have that happened in my life as youth that I realized, wow, I could have been saved a lot of headache. But <laughs> you know, and one of them was from <laughs> right, yeah. So anyway, that's kind of where I came to the realization that thematic learning or whole that whole approach to learning is much more meaningful and better for my children. Now, let me tell you what I've discovered from my experience. First of all, the subject learning is difficult at home because of the whole disconnected approach. So it actually never really does happen. Well, there are homes where you we call that school at home. Yeah. But even uh, then, but, I think it's really hard to disconnect them because like you said, we're using that education together as a family and we're we're creating an application even though... You know, I think right. it is harder to get a disconnected learning, but it is, it is, it can happen, but it but can I think happen. It's harder. Yeah. You know, there are some charter schools at home that are all subject learning charter schools that that can create that kind of environment. I just still think that it's still a better choice because, like you said, um, at home things we're using it all together. It's it while they may be learning it separate, they're not. It's it's not really being disconnected from their lives. But I, what I discovered is that I could really embrace it and purposefully make it happen. And so um, I, as I told you, I met, I met this mentor. Well, first of all, then after, after I kind of had, had embraced this thematic unit approach, that is when I read of the book, The Thomas Jefferson Education, which talked about the phases, the phases of learning, which really come from Erickson, the um, developmental and Mon. Montessori. She's, yeah, Maria Montessori. Montessori was brilliant as far as that was concerned. You know, she she knew, she understood those phases fairly well. And I think the way that she set up her learning environment was really great for those younger kids and how she separated the ages. So, you know, that it, that's not new. The phase learning isn't new. The, the words, core phase, love of learning phase, scholar phase, depth phase, mission phase, those are all new. And the, I mean, those were all Thomas Jefferson education words. And I love the word core phase. I love the word love of learning phase. I love those words. I'm going to say that um, I, I don't think that you go the, a phase approach. It makes you feel like you're going from this phase and then you're going to go to this phase and you're going to leave that phase behind. And actually, that's not how they mean that at all. What they mean, and and I know Rachel and Oliver well personally, and so I've I've heard their explanation. And I would uh, venture to say what they mean, and the book does say this too, is that you, you're learning a certain thing in this phase. So let's say in core phase, you're learning your what they say is you're learning good, bad, right, wrong, true, false, through work and play, right? Yeah. So, but you don't leave that phase to go on to the next phase. You take that into the next phase with you. Well, and there are different things that you can be at different phases in. Like, for instance, with your sewing, you could probably move into that like you were in a scholar phase at a young age, whereas, you know, in another subject that you may not, I mean, if we go back, I guess it's not all subject learning, but, but you know, you're doing different stages, at, I mean, depending on your, yes. of your interests. 
right? At different levels, yeah. maybe. Excellent, excellent description. Yes. I, that, that's how I kind of see that phase learning. And, and if you see it, see, this is where the organic approach comes. If you will look at, let's say we, we observe my sewing, right? Organically, you're going to see how I pick up the fabric and I cut it up and I, and I mess up the sewing machine and I don't know how to do a straight line. And from there to I'm starting to use patterns and I'm pinning things together. And you can see my phases as I'm learning. And then, you know, from there to I'm doing things a little bit more difficult. I'm doing tailoring. I'm doing mitered corners. And from there to now I'm doing my own designs and I have a mentor who's helping me design and I, I use my own, I create my own patterns you know, you can see that organic process happening inside of me. You could call those phases. You could say, you know, she's in a beginning phase. Well, now she's in an in, intermediate phase and now she's in an advanced phase. Now she's in a, their, her own design phase. And you can kind of see that, right? Yeah. So it's and really the application of learning is, I mean, that's what we're talking about when we, when we move, have children move through phases. We don't want them to right. just have knowledge in their head but be able to actually eventually somehow apply it <laughs> later on right and, right and and consume it i i love to say that it becomes part of me and that's why i'm so careful especially with my children who are very in in those very formative ages to not expose them to toxic books and not expose them to things that are going to be detrimental to their growth at that time. You know, when you have this little baby rose, let's talk about it in the, in, in the way that our plants grow. I can over fertilize a baby rose and kill it. Kind of giving it too much information at times that, that it isn't developmentally appropriate, right? Right. And that would exactly. be, yeah. you know, I can kill a seedling by giving it, the wrong fertilization. Yeah. But when my rose is strong and the roots are going down, I can clip its branches off. The roots will go deeper and it's going to grow fuller and stronger. But if I clipped it when it was too young, I'd kill it. Yeah. That's a good so analogy. We have, we have to be super careful about when and where and how we give our children what we give them. And what environments we put them into. So I'm a great advocate of being censoring a lot of what they do at, at, in these younger ages, censoring a lot. And then I actually am a great advocate of when they're 14, 15 or 16, actually giving them an opportunity to read things that I like Frankenstein or, or like um, Dracula. Dracula is a super scary book. Yeah. And I would never, you know, a 12-year-old, I probably would not hand that book to a 12-year-old. But to my 16-year-old, I would say, we're going to read this book and we're going to talk about Satan. Yeah. Because that's what this book is about. And we're going to really talk about how Lucy got sucked into all this. How did, what, what happened to her? Yeah. You know, and, and we're going to talk about Frankenstein and where he went wrong. You know, and, and I may even give him the book, The Hunger Games, which is it's a pretty violent book. And I think it's it's difficult to consume for for children to understand. I don't think it should be consumed at a certain uh, under a certain age, but it's got some amazing symbology in it. Yeah. That and can, if I could draw. Yeah. If I can draw the symbol symbology out of the story itself and I can help them see the role that PETA is playing in Katniss's life through the symbology and why why Katniss's relationship with PETA is different. I'm sorry, what's her other boyfriend's name? I can't remember. <laughs> I can't anyway. either, actually. Uh, yeah, sorry. I know it like the back of my hand, but I don't know why I can't figure it out. Remember. I'm trying to think. Anyway, PETA but, and um, Gil. Gil, Gil, that's right. Gil, Thank you. Gil. Gail, so why those two different relationships are so different and why Katniss struggles so much, why she has this loyalty and love for this childhood Gil, but why PETA is growing her into who she, who she needs to become. 
you know, and we can have those long, those deep conversations at the right appropriate times. Yeah. Well, and I think that kind of, yeah, I know you've tried to <laughs> launch into uh, how your Lemmy schools started, you know, your philosophy and your uh, curriculum with that. What Do you want to kind of move into that, what, what that looked like and how you developed that? Be sure to tune in on Thursday to hear the rest of our interview with Anelity Mill, the Leadership Education Mentoring Institute. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Anelity Mill and the Leadership Education Mentoring Institute, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and consider joining our program by going to the scheduling tab to become a fire starter today. Help support the podcast by making all your Amazon purchases through the free Amazon widget on our website. Also, sign up to receive two free audiobooks from Audible at theluminousmind.net. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, and now Pinterest. Get our audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider telling your friends about us. Leave us a review. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education 